So the core series of Pokemon games has been explored inside and out by now, but I think the spin-off titles have just as much potential to be interesting, and the one I'm most intrigued by is the Pokemon Trading Card Game RPG. I've already made videos on the game's exclusive cards and my appreciation of the card's pixel art, but this video will look at everything else I can think of. On the surface, it's a simple Game Boy card simulator with a small hub world and story to create a short, single-player adventure. But the execution of this is exceptionally fun and charming, and there are lots of small details and mechanics that go mostly overlooked. I love this game and am super excited to talk about it, so let's start from the top. Like the gyms and badges of the main series, Pokemon TCG has eight clubs themed around the different energy types. Each club has three club members, and winning against them in card duels unlocks the club master, who gives you a master medal when defeated. Get all eight medals and you can enter the Pokemon Dome, where the game's Elite Four, called the Grand Masters, battle you consecutively for inheritance of the four legendary cards. Instead of money, defeated opponents give you two 10-card booster packs. These, along with the starter deck given to you by Professor or Dr. Mason, make up your card collection, which you build your decks from. That should be enough info to follow along if you haven't played the game. And if you have, I promise there's stuff in here that you've never seen before, so stick around. And maybe subscribe because I'm really close to 10,000, okay thanks. Starting off with unused content, there's a completely different title screen that went unused in both the Japanese and English games. There's both a black and white version and a color version. Unlike the final screens, the energy orbs here are baked into the background and wouldn't rotate around. This still looks super cool though. There's also two early versions of the last credit screen. In the start menu, you can reveal a hidden debug option by entering these codes although selecting it no longer works. So this code will display the actual menu after resetting the game. Selecting Power On does what you'd expect, Dual Mode, CGB Test, and V Effect don't do anything, Continue from Diary jumps right to your last save, or starts a new game if there isn't one. And Credits plays the credits. SGB Frame is an interesting one. On the Super Game Boy, it loads a unique frame showing the currently used color palettes and a dashed grid overlaid on the game screen, which I didn't even know was possible. This frame will be replaced if another one is loaded in, like in the hub world, but other debug screens and the credit sequence can still be viewed like this. Standard BG character shows the partial contents of the Game Boy's tile RAM, which is pretty cool to see in-game without an emulator. If you select this option after viewing the credits, you'll see the tile set for the last viewed scene in the sequence, The Hall of Honor. Or, after selecting Create Booster Pack, you can view how a card's graphics are stored. Here you can generate infinite packs of the four sets, plus one with just energy cards. But what are these numbers for? Well, it turns out they determine which energy card you'll receive as the tenth card in a booster pack. I never realized this, but nearly all club members and masters give you packs with their club's energy in them, and this is how. Even Dr. Mason's emails about the club master's weaknesses give you the energy they're weak to in the attached booster. Mystery and Laboratory don't have options for every energy type because not every club awards them, unlike the more common Colosseum and Evolution. The energy pack has only four options, Lightning and Fire, Water and Fighting, Grass and Psychic, and just Random. Only the Random pack is ever used in-game though, by Tex Aaron and Sam. After Sam's intro tutorial, you can have a normal duel using the same non-shuffled practice decks and two prize cards, which is impossible to lose if you just attack every turn. Aaron is unique in that he lets you choose one of his three decks to play against, which happen to be the same types as the unused energy packs, so it's very odd he doesn't award them for beating the corresponding deck. Anyway, both of these options are a complete waste of time compared to this tech in the corner, who will just give you 60 energy cards if you have less than 10 energy outside your decks. This is super easy to achieve with your starter deck by just swapping out a few cards. And this trick can be repeated until you run out of deck space to hide your hordes of energy. So just how many cards can you collect? In terms of raw copies, you're limited to 99 of each. 
Multiply that by 228 available cards, and you could own 22,572 in total. But maybe don't try that one. The real goal is to complete your card album, which you can see in several menus. This shows 226 as the total, but doesn't include the two Phantom cards since they're only obtainable through a feature called Card Pop, which I'll talk about later. If you do acquire them, however, this total will increase accordingly. There's also the PC's Card Album Viewer, which tracks your completion by set, or card file as it's called. Here the Phantom cards will appear at the bottom of the promotional file, listed as PXX instead of P19 and 20. Actually, the idea of numbered cards at all is notable, since Japanese cards had no numbers originally. But the game orders these files by type, then Pokedex number. Same for the card and deck menus. The types are likely based on the Pokedex order as well, as when you convert the video game types to their equivalent trading card types at the time, you get Grass, Fire, Water, Lightning, Fighting, and Psychic, with Colorless placed at the end. Curiously, when Japanese sets did start being numbered during the E series, they used a nearly identical system, just adding Darkness and Metal, and switching the order of Fighting and Psychic, which I have no explanation for. The way these in-game sets are constructed is worth mentioning as well. Obviously, these are unique from the actual base jungle and fossil expansions, splitting their contents into four new booster packs. This let the designers include their new Game Boy exclusive cards, as well as equalize the size between sets, which would have otherwise been a problem. They even balanced the card rarities, check it out. Each one features new artwork with a Pokemon from the set, and has some general theming. Colosseum leans towards simpler Pokemon, some missing their evolutions, and all but one lacking Pokemon powers. It's also home to key trainer cards like Professor Oak, Bill, and Computer Search. This is where the six basic energy cards are included in the album files, although you can pull them from every booster pack. Evolution is what it sounds like. Almost all multi-stage cards or standalone final evolutions to complete other sets. Mystery features the Legendary Bird Trio, the Dragonite line, the Fossil Pokemon, Double Colorless Energy, and Mew. If you're wondering why this Mew isn't a promotional card, it was originally part of the Fossil expansion in Japanese, but Wizards of the Coast took it out to use as a Pokemon League promo. Super Energy Retrieval is the opposite case, released first as a Japanese promo card, but wouldn't be brought to English until Neo Genesis. Laboratory contains would-be Poison-type Pokémon, as well as human-influenced Pokémon like Magneton, Mr. Mime, Porygon, and Mewtwo. This is the hardest and least common booster pack to receive from duels, awarded mostly by Club Masters. It also includes the Game Boy Ditto and Electrode cards, which are clearly meant to fill in for Base Set Electrode and Fossil Ditto's notable absence. Ditto especially is hard enough to rule in person, so trying to code these fringe cases for the Game Boy was likely deemed impractical. Still, they were staples of the base through fossil format, while their replacements are laughable in comparison. Instead of Pokemon powers, Ditto and Electrode get three energy attacks with less complicated and worse effects. Oh well. PCs also contain a glossary of common terms and rules, which can also be found in the Duel's check menu. By the way, the term Duel as well as Arena are specific to this game and were never officially used by Pokemon. Better than Match or The Active Spot, in my opinion. If you connect a Game Boy printer, you can make real copies of your cards, or at least their first page, or print out deck lists you stored in the deck save machine or produce a giant list of every card you own for some reason. Now let's look at all the changes between the Japanese and English versions of the game, plus any differences from playing on Game Boy versus Game Boy Color, like the deck save machine screen. More common objects were altered, like chairs, carpets, most kinds of plants, and of course the world map, which gets a major upgrade. Many of these alternate graphics are placed in the Game Boy Color's extra VRAM bank, which the original lacks. The Pokémon Dome uses the most alternate tiles, making it much more unique from the Game Boy version, which just looks like the Challenge Hall. But usually, these changes are more like sacrifices to accommodate the added color. 
The only difference in menus is the energy type icons, which look pretty cool. But you'll notice something else when playing on a Game Boy. Everything is slower. Menuing, loading new screens, waiting on opponents, even some rooms in the hub world have lag now. And hold on, the Japanese color version has the same problem. Even the English version slows down in two-player modes. What's going on here? Well, another enhancement the Game Boy Color received was a double-speed mode, which overclocks the same CPU to run twice as fast, at the cost of less battery life. So obviously the Game Boy version is slower without this. But the original Japanese version also doesn't utilize this feature, even though some places could benefit from it. This was changed internationally, for reasons we'll get into later, but the game still reverts to single speed mode during multiplayer features to keep compatibility with the non-color systems. The English version also altered these graphics of Game Boys found in the Card Pop, Link Duel, and Printer screens to look more like Game Boy Colors. Here's another improvement. In the original game, you couldn't scroll through a card's pages using left or right, only the A button for going forward and nothing for going back. Thank goodness this was added. But the English version also removed these dotted X symbols that would appear next to attacks with additional unseen text. These are actually called reference marks and are used in Japanese to introduce comments or footnotes, just like an asterisk in English. Without them, you can no longer tell which attacks have extra effects and which don't without looking at the full page. I have no clue why this one instance of them was removed, as they're still helpfully visible when choosing an attack to use, and in deck machine menus to indicate a required card is already in your other decks. The Japanese card screen has this kanji, meaning sheets or copies, next to each card amount, which was replaced with nothing. On the dual side, the large card back icons were changed to mirror the English design. These titles for the various dual stages were translated, along with the win and loss graphics, but this part of the loss was obviously misinterpreted and never fixed. The English version also changes the Pokemon card header to look worse for some reason. Promo Mew's Psyshock was corrected from Wizards of the Coast's incorrect translation. So was Clefairy and Clefable's Metronome, which removed the part about ignoring anything else required to copy an attack. Jinx's color palette was made more purple to reflect Wizards' censored version though, and the Paralyzed icon was slightly redesigned, probably to avoid resembling the Nazi SS. But the biggest change is to the title screen, which is completely different between regions. The base, jungle, and fossil boosters in the intro were also nicely redrawn. One graphical aspect you're sure to notice is the super compressed font, which wasn't seen too often on the Game Boy. If you know anything about early RPGs, you're familiar with the constant struggle translators had trying to fit English into Japanese games. This often meant removing details, using the shortest words and sentences possible, or in the case of Pokemon Red and Blue's Pokedex, adding more screens for the complete text. But even this wouldn't be enough to fit the long, word-for-word -word transcriptions of the trading card's names and effects. So Nintendo of America developed a new text engine that combines two letters into one 8x8 pixel tile, often called a half-width font. This means letters are typed two at a time, which you can clearly see by setting the message speed to one. Why is this an option again? This new text engine was largely made possible because, unlike most 8-bit games that used a static set of characters, the original game's text was dynamically copied into VRAM and then placed on screen as needed. This was done to accommodate using hundreds of kanji found all over Japanese Pokemon cards. They couldn't normally fit in memory, so by copying only the required character tiles and using another clever trick of checking the existing characters in RAM and reusing them for all future instances on that screen, large amounts of text could be fit neatly into the Game Boy's limited tile space. So, even though a full-width English alphabet takes way fewer characters and could easily fit into RAM and avoid this system, it was still used for these unique half-width combination tiles. However, since they have to be generated on the fly, the English game on an original Game Boy runs noticeably slower, which likely contributed to the decision to use double speed mode on the color. 
There is still a full width font though, used only on the name input screen and for the player's name itself. The last difference is actually inside the game's cartridge. The Japanese version comes with a built-in infrared communicator for the card pop and gift center features, while the English cartridge does not, using the Game Boy Color's new infrared port instead. Hudson Soft had developed this technology for the original Game Boy under the name GB Kiss, which was included in multiple cartridges and even worked with a PC modem to download new content. But as this never left Japan and the new Game Boy Color had infrared of its own, this additional hardware could be dropped while still retaining the IR features, for the color version at least. Now if you play on just a Game Boy, the clerk at the gift center is turned around, which was never possible to see before, and tells you to get a Game Boy Color. And trying to use Card Pop from the title menu gives this message. But wait, there's still more versions! Played on a Super Game Boy, you'll get this border for the title, and this border everywhere else. The title border was modified to remove the Pocket Monsters card game text from the Pokeballs, I guess because English Pokemon cards didn't say that on the back. The endgame border has 8 slots for the 8 Master Medals, and when you obtain one, a golden copy appears in its corresponding slot. After you've acquired all 8 medals, beaten the Grandmasters, seen the credits, and resumed your save file, the entire border will be gold. And finally, there's the 3DS Virtual Console version, which mostly just removes all connectivity features. Both the Battle Center and Gift Center clerks are visibly normal, but can't be interacted with. Card Pop is disabled as well, making the two Phantom cards unobtainable. A bookshelf in Ishihara's house referencing Card Pop is disabled, but not the first email you receive from Dr. Mason, which is all about Card Pop. The PC's print option no longer works either, and they made Jinx even lighter purple. I assume this will be the version used for the Nintendo Switch Online release whenever that comes out. Alright, new game. There's seemingly no default name option, but if you leave the input blank and choose End, the protagonist's true name is revealed, Mark, or Park in Japan. Leaving a deck name blank will give you the name Deck001 Deck. If you do this again, it makes Deck002 Deck and so on, even if there's no longer a 001 Deck. In the Japanese version, the player's name is used instead of just Deck. But the name screen is interesting in another way, as it uses a different set of number graphics not found anywhere else in the game. This may be an early version of the font that went unchanged after the normal, wider font was created for use outside the screen. Here are some more graphical oddities, like have you ever noticed how your opponent's portrait is shifted to the left? And does your status screen have yellow borders instead of red? For some reason, as soon as you get one master medal, the color palettes for all the medals will be loaded in, and the menu borders palette is overwritten by the lightning medals. This screen is already stretched for colors, making the grass and poison medals share a green palette, and the fighting and rock medals share a brown one. Yellow borders are also used for the card pop and link dual screens, but are probably unrelated and meant to signify the use of multiplayer features. Does this NPC look a bit weird to you? What about this one? Well, in the color version, they're both using part of their upward sprite in their left and right animations. This is the correct version on Game Boy. On the color though, NPCs use different animation data based on their color palettes, and the data for green NPCs is incorrect. As a result, all green chap and lad sprites are affected, including John from the Fire Club and Daniel from the Psychic Club. Fighting Club member Jessica and Grass Club Master Nikki have unique sprites which are wrong as well. Except that Nikki's hair is identical from the back and from the side, so you'd never notice. Speaking of Jessica, there's a notable typo on both Ninetales cards, spelled T-A-I-L-S. The base set card's Fire Blast attack spells it correctly though, and the names were fixed in the European version. Is that not petty enough? Well, there's some floor tiles on the right side of the challenge hall that don't line up correctly. This plant in the Rock Club lobby uses the wrong bottom tile. 
Also, each club's two lobby rooms use two slightly different wall patterns and different picture frame palettes. I assume this one's wrong. The Grass Club's color palette swaps the usual white background for a light tan, which affects the dialogue and menu boxes. The left side of the Water Club's wall is colored black, but the right side is actually dark blue. Boy, I really hope somebody got fired for that one. But what about actual glitches? Well, you probably won't encounter any during normal gameplay, except for one, which you'll likely do on accident. Just go next to any wall, then turn to face it, and you'll begin walking in place. This doesn't look out of place among the other NPCs, and I would assume it's intentional if it wasn't removed in the sequel. Another easy visual bug can be seen with any scrolling dual menu. Go near the bottom of the list, press start to open the card screen, then press down to see the card below it, which doesn't work if you use check. Exit back out, and the selected card will be at the top of the screen, leaving the bottom empty. This doesn't happen in the Japanese version, because you can't press up and down to see other cards like this, which makes me wonder if this behavior was even intentional. If you have in play two evolving Pokémon with the same name, one played this turn and one on a previous turn, try to evolve the one from this turn and you won't get the usual error message reminding you of the rules, but it still won't work. The way Pokémon Trader is programmed isn't quite correct. The Pokémon you choose to trade can be chosen again as the new card from your deck, which goes directly against the card's text. You can even use this effect with zero cards in your deck, only getting an error message after you already used it. But there is a glitch so devastating, yet so easy to pull off, that I'd advise you skip this part if you're planning on playing the game ever again. Alright, on the play area screen, if your cursor is on the lowest option, you can press down plus A at the exact same time and instantly win any duel. It's actually that simple, and there's no drawbacks besides getting stuck sometimes. More specifically, by pressing down, you're placing the cursor outside the menu for one frame before the game redirects you to your play area screen. However, by pressing A on that same frame, you can select that invalid point and execute different code, which happens to exit the duel but since you didn't actually win or lose, the duel's outcome is still set to the result of your previous duel, so by winning one duel, you can win all the rest. And you don't even have to do that, because the outcome value is set to win by default. At least that means you can skip the tutorial. There's also lots of useful intended shortcuts for navigating menus that you might not know about. For example, you can always press start on a card name to check it, which is useful when pressing A won't do that. In the attack menu, press start to go straight to that attack's page. On the main dual screen, you can avoid going through the check menu entirely and just use shortcuts. Start will show your active Pokemon, and B plus start will show your opponent's active Pokemon. Pressing select cycles through the full play area, your Pokemon, your opponent's Pokemon, and back to the main menu. You can also press B plus down and B plus up to see each player's Pokemon. B plus left goes to your discard pile, and B plus right goes to your opponents. If you're in a scrolling card menu, you can press select to sort the cards, and press left or right to go up or down a whole page. And in the deck menus, pressing start on a deck name or while modifying a deck will bring up a list of its contents. The dual mode contains many other facets you can explore, since the developers had to account for tons of possible scenarios. Like have you ever seen this before? If the duel ends in a draw, which is most likely to occur from poison or a self-destruct type attack, a sudden death match is played with one prize until there's a winner. While this rule has remained the same in the modern TCG, others like the ability to retreat infinitely have changed. There's no penalty for mulligans besides showing your opponent your hand, and no disadvantage to going first, which is a problem in link duels. 
For some reason, the player who initiated the duel always goes first. Your opponent's picture also gets an alternate green palette. If you ever attach more than 8 energy to one of your Pokémon, a plus sign appears at the end. You can still see all your energy cards from the retreat menu, though. You'll also notice the energy icons are always sorted by the type order we talked about earlier. Special conditions are shown in two spots next to each active Pokémon, one for poisoned and another for asleep, confused, or paralyzed since you can only have one at a time. The single card screen layout is modified to show these, along with the Pokémon's current HP, attached energy, and position in play. Plus Power and Defender also have dedicated spots next to the HP counters, and since you can stack them, these numbers can each go up to 4. Like the mainline Pokémon games, there's lots of attack animations and sound effects for everything, over a hundred in total, with some being unique to special attacks that you've probably never seen. If you're in a hurry though, you can turn them off in the config menu, but not really. It just replaces any unique animations with the default one. This and the skip some option also let you manually skip delays from most non-attack animations like drawing cards or shuffling. Here's a really small detail. When your Pokémon attacks the opponent, the screen will shake horizontally, but when your opponent's Pokémon attacks you, it shakes vertically. Here's a very rare screen meant for choosing a type of energy. You can only see it by using Venomoth's Pokémon power, Shift, which lets you change its type to any other Pokémon's in play, or Porygon's Conversion 1 and 2 attacks, which can change the defending Pokémon's weakness or Porygon's resistance, respectively. Ammonite's Clairvoyance power, which makes your opponent play with their hand face up, will add an Opponent Hand option to this menu, and make this hand text in the play area screen selectable. Let's talk about randomness. If you've ever tried to reset your game because you didn't get the coin flip you wanted, only to get the exact same flip again, that's no coincidence. Once you enter a duel, the game's RNG variables will stop spinning and won't be touched until they're needed for a random event, such as shuffling your deck. After those random numbers are used, the next numbers in the sequence are generated, and so on. These variables are saved along with the rest of your duel state, so that coin flip won't change no matter how many times you retry. Unless, of course, you use that randomness on something else first, like a shuffle. Your opponent's AI also uses this RNG, meaning they'll always play out their turn the same if nothing changes. Most opponents, like club members, use the generic AI logic, but club masters and grandmasters take it up a notch. Their starting hand will always contain at least two basic Pokémon and two energy cards, and the next several cards they draw from the deck will be similarly rigged. In addition, each master has an internal priority list of which Pokémon to play onto their bench or to the active. They also have a score list to determine which Pokémon should receive energy cards. Some opponents are even coded to make specific actions when they have certain Pokémon in play. For example, Grandmaster Rod prioritizes his Kangaskhan at the start of the duel, using Fetch to draw extra cards. But in any other situation, Rod will rarely play energy cards to Kangaskhan due to the aforementioned score list. The Grandmasters will also avoid playing their legendary cards as their starting Pokémon, so they can later utilize their coming into play abilities. Many Master decks also include one copy of Gambler, which is actually meant to counter a specific strategy. The AI explicitly checks if the only Pokémon in the player's deck is base set Mewtwo, which has the attack Barrier. Discard one Psychic Energy from Mewtwo in order to prevent all effects of attacks including damage done to Mewtwo during your opponent's next turn. This stall deck never worked in real life due to the prevalence of energy removals, but the game's deck lists tend to avoid running tons of broken cards like that, so I guess Gambler was a nice alternative. Once you start using Barrier, your opponent will just wait around until drawing Gambler, then use it to shuffle their hand back into their deck. On the opposite end, Executor's Big Explosion has the potential to deal the most damage out of any attack in the game by far. Most other attacks like this that do more damage for each energy attached have a damage cap, and Rage-style attacks are naturally limited by the Pokémon's HP. 
So in order to do the most damage possible, you'll need one execute, one executor, one gambler to prolong decking out, four double colorless energy, and any other basic energy you want to fill up the rest of your deck. Your opponent's deck should consist of basic Pokémon that are weak to grass and more gambler. At the battle center, we can choose the number of prize cards to duel with, so we'll just use two, which takes the fewest cards out of both decks. The plan is pretty simple. Just hope none of your important cards are prized and start attaching energy to Executor. Since Big Explosion flips a coin for each energy instead of each energy card, having the four double colorless will count as eight flips. When you use Gambler, the coin flip must be tail so you only draw one card afterward, giving you a few more turns to attach energy. Then, after you've drawn your last deck card, it's time to attack. I managed to attach 58 energy, but there is a way to get one more into your deck by using the basic Pokémon Clefairy instead. If your opponent's active Pokémon is Executor, you can use Metronome to copy Big Explosion, but this would disregard the double weakness damage you can get from playing Executor yourself. Of course, in order to deal maximum damage, we need all 58 coin flips to be heads, which has a real-life probability of about 1 in 300 quadrillion. However, using the game's RNG routine, we can find the most consecutive head flips possible is only 20. Or is it? Using these cheat codes, we can actually simulate this event happening. The coins will visually appear the same, but the game will register them as all heads or all tails. Adding in weakness, this results in a total 2,320 damage, which the game decides is 40. Just enough for a knockout. Ever notice how Squirtle's artwork is lower than the original cards? What about Pikachu's? And why is Staryu's off to the right? Well, I never knew this, but all three of these cards received major changes to their artwork when they were printed in English. Squirtle was just framed higher, but Pikachu was actually raised up and had its background modified to compensate. Since Staryu is a 3D model, its position and camera angle could be adjusted to make a new, more centered render. A less obvious difference is with Vulpix, whose Japanese card didn't quite cut out the background here. But there's another interesting aspect of these card graphics that I missed in my pixel art video. If you've ever scrolled between the energy cards, you'll notice the dithering patterns are the same. Which makes sense, because those parts are the same. But now scroll to another card, and its dithering will probably line up as well. It turns out that almost every card uses dithering in the exact same places, which blew my mind. I'd kill to know what utilities they used to make these things back in the 90s. Hey, wanna know how the map works? Every possible combination of paths between two locations is stored in memory as a list of coordinates the player can walk between. There's direct paths, like from Mason Lab to the Fighting Club, but there's also several hidden points in between that are used when the path is more complicated. And the cursor simply uses a list of four locations to go to from its current one based on which direction is pressed. There's lots of NPCs you can duel, trade with, and talk to, but I'll just mention a few here. Gene is the only clubmaster with no prerequisite for dueling him. You can skip the rest of the rock club entirely. But you can also skip the fire club by collecting at least 300 cards, and the psychic club by obtaining 4 master medals. The water club master, Amy, can only be seen standing when this club member Joshua initially lets you pass. After you duel her, or if you just decline at first, she'll go back to laying in the pool chair forever. Using the debug menu, you can see that these are actually two different sprites. A lad in the fire club lobby will ask to have all of your energy cards in exchange for a secret. Despite what he might say, the amount of energy cards you have isn't important, you just need three master medals. After that, you only need one available energy card to give him, so put as many as you can into your decks before talking. It's very important that you then accept his offer. If you decline at this point, he'll run out of the lobby and never return. After giving him your free energy, a promotional slowpoke will appear behind this picture. If you try looking beforehand, you won't find anything. 
Talking to this lass in the water club will activate Imakuni, who will randomly show up in the corner of club lobbies. However, this is a lot less random than you might think. He can only appear in four specific maps, the Fighting Club, Lightning Club, Water Club, or Science Club. He also respawns every time your save file is loaded, unless you're in the room with him. Imakuni's dual AI is unique in a number of ways. He'll never retreat his active Pokémon, and will randomly play Maintenance and Pokémon Flute on whatever cards he can. His deck contains a copy of Gambler, but he'll randomly play that too, and won't catch on to Mewtwo's Barrier Stall like everyone else. And of course, he'll use his signature trainer card to confuse his own Pokémon and then attack with them. Defeating Imakuni rewards you 4 booster packs instead of 2, but on the 3rd and 6th time he'll give you his promo card instead. In the Japanese version of the game, Imakuni says he sings Can You Name All the Pokémon, which is true to his real-life character. However, in English he references the Poké Rap instead, which thankfully he does not sing. In all versions of a game, there's a space before Ronald's name at the start of a duel. That space would normally go between the opponent's class, like club member or strange life form, and their name, but Ronald is the only duelist who lacks one. He's also the only one to use four different decks throughout the game, one after you obtain the second master medal, another after the fifth master medal, a third during challenge cups, and a fourth as the final opponent after defeating the Grand Masters. Each of these decks uses different type combinations, testing your decks for different weaknesses. While Ronald appears in Ishihara's house after defeating him at the Pokémon Dome, the only way to duel him again is through his random appearances at the challenge cups. There are two preset challenge cups during the story though, one after obtaining your third master medal and another after your fifth. During these, you can find Ronald waiting in the lobby beforehand, and he'll be your final opponent. You'll also notice that your name is used instead of your opponent's before the first duel. After beating the game, there's a small chance a challenge cup will be happening every time your save file is loaded, except if you're already in the challenge hall. These are the only way to obtain promotional cards besides the one copy each from unique NPC events. Well, except for the legendary cards, which you'll need to defeat the four Grandmasters again to receive just one card. Ah, the Golden Door. Truly a worthy opponent to the Mew Truck. What's behind it? Nothing. The game's been completely disassembled at this point, and there's no leftover data that could possibly be for an unused room or something. I've heard it's where the Challenge Cup opponents are supposed to come from, but no, they wait in the lobby. Why this door was created? Why a guide was placed there only during Challenge Cups to block your path? Why it was removed in the sequel? We may never know. Once you beat the game, Dr. Mason will build a new device called the Challenge Machine. With only one deck, you'll have to duel against five random opponent's decks in a row, three from club members, one from a club master, and the last from a grand master. If you defeat all five, your win streak goes up by one, but if you lose at any point, it resets to zero. You could just go around dueling random people and get real rewards like booster packs, but that wouldn't give you a high score. This score is actually more permanent than you'd expect. Due to how Dr. Mason's high score is first initialized, the player's name and highest win streak go untouched when your save data is deleted meaning a new player would still be competing against your old records. The first auto deck machine you can access appears to have the three starter decks Dr. Mason offers you, but if you compare the deck lists, there's some major differences, and you won't even own all the cards to build them at first. Originally, these decks had slightly different names in Japanese, using a synonym for friends instead, but the original starter versions are still available in the deck save machine. The other deck machines require master medals to operate, and usually contain one or two decks from those club members. The science deck machine contains all four decks from its club though. The fighting deck machine contains the bone attack deck, which Dr. Mason refers to as the Cubone and Marowak deck in the mail, which was its original name in Japanese. And finally, there's the legendary deck machine, 
which you can only access by defeating the Grand Masters and entering the Hall of Honor. It uses a unique set of graphics and contains each Grand Masters deck plus the mysterious Pokemon deck, which is the only way most players will ever see Phantom, Mew, and Venusaur. The deck requires two of each Phantom card, so good luck with that. Actually, I can guarantee that no one has ever built this deck without cheating, because one of the Phantom cards was accidentally made impossible to obtain, 